Okay. I don't want to take anyone more time. So I wanted to welcome, every, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Gordon JCC for the Nashville Jewish Book Series in your living room. I'm Alex Heller. I'm the adult director. Uh, it's nice to see everyone on here in an actual Zoom meeting after this week, especially at home. <laughs> but just make sure to please stay on mute throughout the conversation and we'll have time to answer questions at the end. So feel free to type them in the chat section. Tonight we have Sue Eisenfeld in conversation with Margaret Littman. Uh, she'll be speaking about Wandering Dixie, Dispatches from the Lost Jewish South. Thank you to the Jewish Book Council for bringing, her, bringing us Sue Eisenfeld tonight. We have two more talks uh, in April, Beth Kalb and Michael Ian Black. So check out our website, nashvillejcc.org forward slash book or Eventbrite. Thank you so much to tonight's sponsors, the Vanderbilt Jewish Studies Department. Thank you for your continued support. And we actually have uh, a, a representative from the Gold Ring Woldenberg Institute of Southern Jewish Life, the Director of Development, Risa Klein Herzog, to speak brief, briefly about the ISJL. So welcome, Risa. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And it's wonderful to see so many faces that I recognize and names that I, I recognize as well. Thank you, Alex. I was so pleased when Amy Goldstein invited the ISJL, the Institute of Southern Jewish Life, to be a part of the Nashville Jewish Book Series. And it's very nice to be connected to the impressive Vanderbilt University Jewish Studies, Studies Department. So thank you for sharing that co-sponsorship. Um, I don't know, Southern Jews. We are either from here and never left here, which in this case is Nashville, which in this case is my story. Uh, we are from the South and we move somewhere else within the South, or we move from outside the South and we claim it as our own, we choose it. But whatever or wherever your story, Southern and Jewish it what, is what some of what brings us here tonight and for 20 plus years, the Institute of Southern Jewish Life based in Jackson, Mississippi has been existing to support, connect and celebrate Jewish life uh, throughout the South. It exists to ensure, ensure Jewish continuity, to provide Jewish experiences and opportunities to live a Jewish life wherever you may live in the South, small town, big city, and to make Jewish cho choices that hopefully lead to other Jewish choices and lead to continued Jewish continuity. The ISJL supports, connects, and celebrates Jewish life through three pillars, education, spiritual, and cultural. And through these different pillars, we again provide opportunities for Jewish education through our curriculum where our fellows go into communities in 70 plus communities with over 4,000 students in our Jewish education program. I'm proud that Nashville is one of our newest education partners with the Temple uh, joining this year as an education partner. So we're very excited to be a part of this. And on a personal note uh, for, I am a Southern Jew and for 22 years, I worked in the Gordon Jewish Community Center building. And so for me personally, I worked at the Federation. Um, I'm very proud to be partnering with the JCC and I am so pleased to learn from both Margaret and Sue tonight, and I am thrilled to be part of all of our efforts to encourage Jewish continuity. So thank you for letting the ISJL speak and to be part of it tonight, and um, thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Risa. Uh, and I am very happy to tell you about our moderator for tonight, Margaret Littman, who will then introduce our author, well, another author, because Margaret is an author too, Sue Eisenfeld. Margaret is a journalist and author who tells the stories of the people and places of the American South, particular, particularly Nashville and Memphis, Tennessee, the Mississippi Delta, the Natchez Trace and beyond. Her work has appeared in the forward Condé Nast Traveler, the Nashville scene and under the moon guidebook imprint. She prefers to road trip than fly so she can make a U-turn for a donut or falafel as needed. She's happy to have been volunteering with the Jewish Book Series Committee this year. She's been on our selection committee. So thank you to Margaret and to Amy Goldstein, who's our chair and to the rest of the committee. Please welcome Margaret Littman. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. 
So in my own research, as Alex mentioned, I, I write guidebooks. And for my research for this book, The Moon, Nashville to New Orleans Road Trip Book, I visited many of the same places that Sue Eisenfeld did for Wandering Dixie, remarking on the architecture and the stained glass of the synagogues and the essential roles of the Jewish communities in these places I heard of how the city of Natchez, Mississippi wouldn't exist today, wouldn't have survived if it weren't for Jewish merchants who loaned money to plantation owners after the boll weevil decimated their crops. So when Alex and Amy asked me to volunteer on the Nashville Jewish Book Series Committee, and I saw that Sue's book was on this list of potential titles from the Jewish Book Council, I was pretty excited. I was already a, aware of this book uh, thanks to an online writers group that Sue and I both belong to. Uh, author Sue Eisenfeld lives in Virginia and she's on the faculty at Johns Hopkins. And many of the books, many of the themes that she writes about in this book, which is her second book, felt, feel even more acute uh, to me over this last year. She talks about the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis and the distrust that populations of color uh, may have when it comes to government health initiatives as a result. And that's something that we're seeing in real time now as it relates to the coronavirus vaccine. And in Alabama, she talks about the closing of voting sites and the effect that that had on voter turnout. And that's something that's now been an issue in the news, particularly in Texas and Alabama and Georgia. Uh, Wandering Dixie definitely is a different kind of book than the other books in our series. It's, it's essentially a travel book that we're asking you to read and discuss in a time when most of us aren't traveling. Um, I hope that it encourages all of us to think about the places that we go and our preconceived notions about community and geography. So Sue, thank you for being here from Virginia and talking to us. Um, why don't we start with the big picture? What, why did you decide to do this research? Well, first I just wanna thank you all for having me, uh, for inviting me to this and, and for all of you for being here tonight uh, from all over the country. I hope that everyone is safe and obviously you have power, so that's good. Um, so thanks, thanks for joining. Um, why did I do this research? I mean, ultimately, my first experience with the idea of Jewish Confederates, which was in Richmond, kind of blew my mind. As a northerner, I had no idea that there were Jewish Confederates, even as I had lived in Virginia already for 15 years, I had never knew about that concept. And so what that sparked in me was, okay, so there were Jews in this country much earlier than I thought. There were Jews fighting on the side of the South. How could this be given that Jews commemorate their freedom from slavery? every year at Passover, right? That, that was the essential question that got me started. So why I did this research was to educate myself about this place, the South that had nurtured the Jews, that had been good to the Jews so much so that they were willing to fight for it, um, kind of going against a lot of my Northern assumptions about Jewish history. Um, that was the essential thing that got me going, my curiosity. You know, as a Northerner, I really didn't know anything about Southern Jewish history. Um, and um, I was somewhat influenced by having read Tony Horwitz's book, Confederates in the Attic. He's also a Jewish writer who traveled around the South. And I'd always sort of had it in my head that I would love to do my own version of Confederates in the Attic, but he'd already really done it. So once I sort of got this idea of these old Jewish communities, um, you know, Jews having come to the South much earlier than I was aware of. And, um, and once I realized I wanted to do kind of a small town 
rural experience, what became, in my mind, the lost Jewish communities, um, that kind of became the, the journey I wanted to take was to find out what, where, where they were, what, what were they like? What did places look like? What did people sound like? I had never even heard a Southern Jewish person speak, honestly, when I began this book. So that was the origin. And did you, did you set out to do, to write a book or did you set out to do research and then the research turned into a book? I, I began exploring my curiosity about Jewish Confederates without having a book in mind. And in fact, it wound up turning into an article that was in the New York Times called Passover and the Confederacy. And so I had done about six months worth of research to produce that article, but I didn't feel finished with that idea. I had only gone to Savannah and Charleston at that point to sort of investigate and see if this was really true, you know, that Jews had come over here as early as the 1600s and some of these really old places really existed. Um, of course it was true, but I had to go there for myself and I, and I just got this bug. So, um, I eventually decided I needed to explore it further and it, it took me uh, many years to kind of pull together the idea. But then, yes, I, I went to the South, um, over many different trips, uh, over about three or four years, knowing that I was going to write something about it. But be, as a travel writer, as I'm sure, you know, Margaret, um, you know, sometimes you do some planning, but other times things are very spontaneous. You don't really know what's going to happen. And so, although I did have some ideas, I wanted to go down South to explore, um, the civil war was my first idea. And then I wanted to go down South to explore Southern culture, which is some of what, what I did, food, music and whatnot. And then I decided this was going to be a trip of the lost Jewish South. But then what happened that I, um, did not expect was that I found myself, um, traveling the landscape of the civil rights movement, um, going from Selma to Montgomery and coming across things like you said that to, you know, I, I, I wound up in Tuskegee, um, meeting some people that had were descendants of Tuskegee, Tuskegee syphilis study, um, victims, I guess you could call them. Um, I wound up traveling the landscape of, um, Goodman, Schwerner and Cheney, um, I'm actually distantly related to Andrew Goodman. I didn't even know I would find myself there, but um, so the ideas of the civil rights movement um, became more and more prevalent on my trip. Meanwhile, you know, I'm traveling during 2016, 2017, when like anti-Semitic and racist acts in this country were becoming more and more prevalent. And so in some ways, while I was looking back into the 60s at what had happened, you know, things were starting to repeat themselves. So the book, you know, it is focused on Jewish history, but it does also cover this intersection of Jewish, Southern Jewish history and African American history. Uh, and so that was, I guess, somewhat unexpected and, and I didn't set out to write a book about that, but, um, that is, that's what happened. And, uh, one of my readers actually pointed out to me that more of the book deals with issues of race. If you count pages than uh, Jewish issues, although I think overall it, it is a very Jewish book. I know you wrote almost 300 pages to answer this, but, um, how, how do you feel like this book changed your perspective or challenged some of these preconceived ideas you had? Well, um, I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing that it did for me and, and just by doing the research was it, it opened, um, my worldview, you know, I, I, am a northerner, I, um, had certain assumptions about when Jews came to this country what they were like as a group like for example i just thought jews were always really into social justice um so coming to learn for example that jews were slave owners um 
and fought for the Confederacy with really new ideas for me. But I guess I wanted to approach all of this with a really open mind um, to, you know, try to learn about the motivations of the times and whatnot. But it wound up being a real journey of becoming more woke for me. Um, I have to admit that there were times in the last few years where I really didn't know what institutional racism meant, like concretely. Um, I didn't always understand white privilege or what that really meant for me. So one of the things that this whole journey taught me was that it seems to be that that Jews wound up overall being successful despite anti-Semitism in large part because they were white. You know, they were not the so-called lowest rung on the ladder. And, and I think that, you know, um, it's a real process to come to understand how, how one is um, involved or impacted with, with these ideas um, that are that are being discussed more and more now. And so the book for me was my journey to learn more about all of this. Um, not that, you know, we are each responsible for um, every bad thing that has happened in the past, but at least to understand how we have benefited from things and how we might move forward in the future. Uh, so that's one of the ways that it changed me. I also became more, um, involved or more interested in Judaism. Um, something I write about in the book is just that I have never been very, um, very religious and very practicing. And I sort of took Judaism for granted in a way. I've always lived in large metropolitan areas where you didn't really have to be Jewish because there were plenty of other Jewish people who are like keeping it alive. And now I'm going down south to these small, places where they're just hanging on and they're so grateful to have anyone show up at services. It, it just really made me feel like you can't take everything for granted, that what happens when people don't come is that they disappear. Um, and so um, it, it gave me a new newfound appreciation for my religion. Those, to answer your question, those were some of the ways this changed me. And I'm hoping that for readers that, that the book might open minds in terms of, you know, readers own biases or assumptions, and maybe readers will have their own journey of, of wokeness, you know, everyone is on their own path of that idea. I know I've going to some of these places that I know we're going to talk about, like Natas and Port Gibson and the Delta Meridian Mississippi I've it was very powerful to me to go to these places where and because I was doing different kinds of research not necessarily thinking about what the Jewish communities were like or had been there and to go to these places with very small Jewish populations but see these remnants and um these parts of this community that had existed sort of everywhere. I found that to be very powerful. Um, and I know you have some photos of some of the places you, you went. Do you wanna share those with us? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. That works, that, that's a good um, segue into um, some of what I have. So it says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So maybe the host can enable me to share my screen. Alex, can you help us? I'm working on that. Try it again. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, there we go. Thank you. All right, so Is that showing up okay for everyone? Like you can see my whole screen of photo. Okay. Yeah, I just thought I'd show you some pictures of some of the places I went and what I found. Um, this is the first place I go in the book. It's Eufaula, Alabama, and it's the Jewish cemetery from 1845. There were 105 Jews in 1878 in this town, 
And the reason I went there was because there's only one family left now. And one person who's kind of the spokesperson for the whole Jewish religion. Um, there's no temple left. The cemetery is in disrepair. Um, I don't have any photos of it in disrepair, but you know, it, it was the kind of sad beginning of, of what I was doing, which was going to places that were lost and finding all the ways that, um, <laughs> that they've kind of fallen apart. Um, I put this photo up because for some people, maybe not this crowd, but sometimes when I talk to Northern audiences, they've never seen a Confederate grave, much less a Jewish Confederate grave. And for any of you who have been to national cemeteries, you know that in national cemeteries, um, pretty much everyone has a white marble gravestone that's curved at the top, but Confederates have this pointy um, gravestone. And although this is not a national cemetery, these are the types of graves that would be in national cemeteries. So these are some of the Jewish Confederates in Eufaula, Alabama. One of the places I went was Notasolga, Alabama. And the reason I went there is because of Julius Rosenwald, who is a Northern Jew who did good work down South. He teamed up with Booker T. Washington. He, by the way, um, Rosenwald was president of Sears Robot Company. Um, he teamed up with Booker T. Washington to create 5,000 schoolhouses for black children in the South. And so I investigated three of them. Um, the reason this was so noteworthy was that white governments were not providing for black students. They were giving most of the money for schools to white schools. And so um, Rosenwald and Washington built these 5,000 schools. And this one is um, in Notasoga. It's called the Shiloh Rosenwald School. I did also go to the Cairo Rosenwald School, mm -hmm. which is just out of Nashville. And I do write about that in the book as well. Of course, I went to Selma, Alabama, um, which is you know, where so much of the civil rights movement um, took place. This is Temple Michigan, Israel from 1899. Um, Jews settled in Selma in the 1830s. There were 140 families in this congregation in um, the 1920s. And at the time that I was in Selma, there were seven congregants left. And now I believe there's about four. So this is an example of a place that, um, you know, it's, it's in disrepair. Um, it needs renovation. They are fundraising for it, but it's in that kind of never, never land situation where it doesn't have a bright future, but it's full of history. It's a beautiful place. Everybody really wants it to be preserved. Natchez, Mississippi could have also been in the same um, situation. Uh, this is B'nai Israel. This is also my background the stained glass windows from this synagogue. Um, it is the oldest congregation in Mississippi. The first Jewish peddlers came in the 1700s. Um, at this synagogue, there were 450 members in 1905. And when I was there a few years ago, there were 12 congregants left. So it was sort of at that point at which they really needed renovation. They needed to decide, they needed to figure out what to do about it. Um, they, I believe, paired with the ISJL, the Institute of Southern Jewish Life, mm -hmm. to raise money to renovate the place. And it is now still in use as a synagogue, but it is also, I believe, an arts and events venue. So um, I believe that that's how this place found to save itself. Um, this is actually the second temple. The first was built in 1872 and burned down. And Natchez is one of the places of many different places where I heard the story that when a synagogue burnt down, the Christian community really wanted to help the Jews rebuild. And, and that is what happened here. Um, they felt that the, the Jews needed their Jewish church and they were going to help them do it. And um, when I was there, it was for a conference. This was the most people that this synagogue had had for years or like 200 people were typically they were 12 
and I happened to talk to the woman next to me. And it turns out she wasn't Jewish and we were there for Friday night services. And I asked, you know, why are you here? And she said that she just delighted in the space. And I thought it was just so lovely that the Christian community is still so supportive of this and some of the other synagogues. Now this, um, isn't a Jewish slide or a Jewish place, but one of the things I do in the book is sort of investigate the incredible disparity of wealth between the wealthiest people in America, which had their homes along the Mississippi River and had their plantations with all of their slaves and the enslaved population who lived in uh, structures such as this. Um, it's, it's not surprising, of course, we know that um, the enslaved population was generally not treated well, but in the book, I, I do some comparisons. It's really interesting to hear what some of the Jewish slave owners have to say about how they perceived slaves, sl slaves' lives on their plantations, and then to hear the slaves themselves describe their lives. It's obviously very different. And then, you know, for some people that I've been talking to, and I was in this situation myself, like I had never seen a plantation and some of my viewers and readers have never seen a plantation either. So this is just a picture of a cotton plantation. Um, in some places, these plantations are literally as far as the eye can see without um, an end in the horizon. Um, you know, this is what cotton looks like. Apparently it is it is a white flower one day or a red flower one day, a white flower the next day, and within two weeks you have cotton bowls. So um, this is in Margaret's territory that she was uh, talking about. This is Port Gibson, Mississippi. And um, this synagogue was from 1892. The first Jews came here in 1839. Um, and there were as many as 171 congregants in 1905. Now there are none. No Jewish people left in this town whatsoever. And so interestingly, you know, this place was going to be torn down. I think I heard it was going to be a parking lot. Um, but two private individuals bought the place. They're not Jewish, but they have um, worked to keep it up. So this, that's how this place saved itself. And then we have um, Clarksdale, Mississippi, which is in the Mississippi Delta, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, one way that I described the Delta in my book, I say that it is, it may be the most sparsely Jewishly populated formerly most Jewishly populated collection of small towns in the South. And in Clarksdale, there were two synagogues. Neither one of them is in use anymore. Uh, this is the latter one. It's been sold apparently to a black church. It was built in um, about 1910 here, but it might be 1919. Um, there were many families um, at this synagogue, which began in 1896. Um, 131 children were in the Sunday school in 1939 as an indication of uh, the size. And now there are fewer than seven Jewish people left in the community. Obviously, they're not going to these synagogues because they're not open anymore, but they are keeping up the cemetery, which I was very happy to see. So one of the things that I found interesting, kind of like what Margaret was saying earlier, where you go to these small towns, they're not very Jewish now, but there are these signs that the Jews used to be there. In Clarksdale, Shankerman's um, was a store that opened in 1919. It's still in operation. Um, Kirstein's, this was, this is how it is in a lot of the places where you might look down at the tile of a place might not be the store anymore, but the tile is still there. Kirstein's opened in the 1920s. In um, Eufaula, Alabama, I'll just say that, you know, the, it, there's really, it doesn't look very Jewish at all, but um, I looked up at a particular building and there were these circular windows with metal grates. And I could only tell with a telephoto lens of my camera that they were actually stars of David 
on the metal grates from the old days. Um, this was in Greenwood, Mississippi. Same thing. I, I looked up and I saw Klein and Blumenthal department store. So, aha, there were Jews here. And this is from 1905. It is no longer the department store. Um, this was from a time when there were many Jews in the community. This place was once considered the cotton capital of the world. And then we have a place in Louisiana, St. Francisville. This is Temple Sinai from 1902. The first Jews came there in the 1850s. This temple was built in um, 1902, 1903, but it closed already in 1921 because like many of the small towns I went to, the Jews started to go to other places for better business opportunities. Um, just bigger cities, more opportunity, and so um, there are no Jews left in St. Francisville either. But a place- I ask you that, is that, did most of these small towns have this same essential narrative arc of why there were Jews and now there aren't? Yeah, well, yeah. So many of them, the Jews found better opportunities elsewhere. Sometimes people would say to me, well, we send our kids off to college and they don't want to come back. And really they don't want to come back because there are better opportunities elsewhere. So whether it's like the person who owns the business and the, the son or daughter doesn't want to keep up the business, um, that's something that happens. Or whether, you know, the kids just get sent off to college, they don't want to come back. Um, you know, during different stages of the cotton industry, um, the opportunities sometimes moved around. Um, actually, in one other place I went, Natchitoches, Louisiana, like at some point the river changed course and it wasn't even on the river anymore. So, um, you know, opportunities came and went. But yes, I think for the most part, all of these small towns have the same general narrative. Of course, there's always some intermarriage and things like that, but for the most part, the Jews are going to bigger cities. And, and that's where we're finding now, you know, that the, the populations of Jews in the South tend to concentrate. So, um, I mean, that, the, the river moving was part of the Rodney Port Gibson, the Mississippi River shifting. That was part of what made lots of people leave that area. Right? Yeah, so there were a lot of factors. Um, but yeah, so this place managed to save itself by turning into an events venue, even though there are no Jews left, it is being preserved and they're actually also working on a museum to the history of Jews of Louisiana in this town. This is the outside of the old synagogue, which you can see looks kind of like a church. And I just thought this was interesting too in St. Francisville that this is a old, um, mansion house called Evergreen Zine, which is Yiddish for surrounded by greenery. And just a couple of more pictures. Um, this doesn't look like a very Jewish photo, uh, but there, there are lots of towns in the South that have Jewish names. So I was going through Arkansas anyway. I saw that there was a Felsenthal being an Eisenfeld. I felt some kind of connection with Felsenthal and I just decided I had to go here. Um, this is a town that was founded by a few Felsenthal brothers in uh, the early 1900s for their timber company. It was a timber company town. It had a Felsenthal Opera House, a Felsenthal Bank, Felsenthal Hotel, but it flooded too much. They had to abandon it. And now it's kind of like a hunting and fishing camp. There are no Jews. And the whole area that flooded pretty much permanently is now the Felsenthal National Wildlife Refuge. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting anecdote. And then for my final slide, I just wanted to talk about Charleston for a minute. Two chapters of my book are about Charleston. I found it such a fascinating place. 40% of all enslaved people came through the port of Charleston. Charleston is where the beginning of Reformed Judaism in America happened. Some of the earliest Jews of the country came through Charleston and of course is the beginning of the Civil War. That's what most people know about it. One of the things I really wanted to do in this book was to investigate a Jewish slave owner. I just was sort of 
you know, shocked by the idea. I wanted to go to a Jewish plantation and I wanted to sort of follow the life of a Jewish slave owner. So this is a um, grave at the Cumming Street Cemetery, which is the oldest surviving Jewish burial ground in the South. Um, it's got Revolutionary War soldiers in it, Civil War soldiers. Um, this is Mordecai Cohen, and uh, I investigate him and his two sons, David and Marx, who are all slave owners. And what I found interesting about him and all the others is that they were all very um, well liked in their community and were considered good men. Mordecai Cohen, for example, was one of the wealthiest men in South Carolina. He was uh, he donated money to the Charleston Orphan House, which was the first public orphanage in the United States. He was commissioner of the railroad and the orphan house and the director of this and that markets for the city of Charleston and whatnot. He was president of the congregation. He was a peddler first, like many Jews are. He worked his way up to be shopkeeper and then plantation owner and slave owner. And on his grave, he it says he was a good citizen, an enterprising merchant, one of the largest contributors to the improvement of the city. And by his strict integrity, his just and charitable disposition, he won the confidence and the esteem of the community. And he was a slave owner. And oh, I do have one more slide. So the final slide is just to put to to juxtapose, which is what I do in the book, the history of Jews in the South and racial issues. This is in Charleston. It is the Calhoun Monument that was erected for the senator who called slavery a positive good, which is right next door to the Charleston Holocaust Memorial. And there's an engraved stone as part of this memorial that really moved me, especially with the juxtaposition of these two things. It said, we remember the Holocaust to alert ourselves to the dangers of prejudice, to express our outrage at the scourge of racism and to warn the world that racism can lead to genocide. And so that gives you kind of a sense of like where I wound up going with the book in the end. I think this uh, summarizes it right here. Thank you. There's, there's so much to unpack there. Um, yeah. <laughs> we wanna make sure that we have um, a lot of folks here and a lot of, um, I think we have a lot of folks with questions. So we want to make sure that we um, have time for all of those. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, um, people want to put questions in the chat box. We can answer, I can read them that way, or um, people can raise their hand and unmute and ask questions. I did get uh, a couple of questions text to me, texted to me while you were talking. Oh, okay. Uh, let me start with one of those from Miriam. Um, wants to know if you ever felt like a voyeur or a sociological tourist when you were out doing your research. Thanks for that question. Well, you know, as a travel writer, it's kind of a, a good thing to feel like an outsider because it makes you ask questions and like, to kind of be the the dumb one who doesn't know anything like explain it to me show me tell me mm -hmm. and so um i wouldn't say i felt like a voyeur i felt like an outsider who an outsider insider in a way i mean you know at least i was jewish even though i didn't i had never gone to so many services in my life as i went to on this trip but um you know i think that there was there's a benefit to to being that outsider to being the listener you know, to have things explained. And so I did put myself in that position on purpose so that, you know, people would talk to me about things that you might not otherwise um, engage in conversation about. I, I have a quick question. Have you ever been to the, the town in Louisiana called Paplin? K -A oh, Paplin. Um, no, I didn't, but that's one of those towns named after a Jewish person. I'm aware of it, but I didn't get there, unfortunately. Because I'm a Kaplan myself, and I'm curious. That, that'll be good research for the people. I yeah. guess, yes. There were a lot of places that I didn't get to. Um, I'll just say, you know, 
this was a self-funded effort at the time and you know there's just so many there's so many small towns that sounded so interesting where Jews had lived or still lived I couldn't get to all of them. <laughs> Nancy Flexer you have your hand raised. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? I have a question. Oh okay. Um, then I will read. Uh, okay, Cindy, um, you have a question? Do you want to? Yes, I do. So the last time I was home in Brunswick, Georgia, where I'm from, and I was going through the cemetery, I noticed that everybody my nanny and papa's age had the Mason sign on their, um, on their tombstone. And I was curious, I don't know anything about that. Was that a common uh, a common organization for people of that generation to belong to so much so that they had the insignia on their tombstone. Does anyone that's, know that? That's I don't a great know. question, Cindy, and it's not one that I can actually answer, but I, I know what you're talking about and I've seen it as well. Um, there's so much to know about all the symbols on gravestones. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, thanks. So uh, Deanna asks, while you were in Charleston, did you see any references to Judah Benjamin uh, from the Revolutionary War? Yes, um, I'm kind of fascinated by Judah Benjamin. Um, for anyone who doesn't know who he is, he started off as a US Senator from Louisiana and wound up uh, becoming, oh, there's echo. I don't know if that's me. Um, <laughs> wound up becoming um, Secretary of State and Secretary of War of the Confederacy. Um, and he did um, spend some of his growing up years in Charleston. Um, there is a mural, I believe, in the Reform Synagogue in Charleston that has Judah Benjamin on it. Um, that may be the only um, official memorial to him there, but, but he's definitely noted on there. Um, there, I, I, I wish that I could have gone to what were his former plantations, but, you know, as you must know, they've, they've burned down. Um, so there aren't that many things left, uh, about him in, in the country. So our, our next question from Nancy Rudner asks about, um, the history of anti-Semitism in the South and what you what you learned about that. Um, what um, she asked, was that why these communities left? My experience in the South was many Baptists trying to save my soul and help me find Jesus. Wasn't that part of the Jewish Southern experience? Well, I'll just say that no one, no one I spoke with or nothing I read indicated that um, anti-Semitism was something that drove them out of the small towns. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, I'll say that no one I spoke to really talked about having experienced much anti-Semitism in the South. People did tell me that, some people said, for example, that they didn't experience anti-Semitism until they moved to the North. So the only thing I think I ever heard from anyone, one person said that they, weren't allowed to join the country club in their community for a time, but nobody spoke of anti-Semitism in the South. And so, like I said, just none of the sort of scholarly um, resources that I've, that I've read have indicated that anti-Semitism was the reason people left these small towns at all. Now that's not to say there wasn't any, um, but I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I, um, had assumed as a northerner was that the, the South was just full of anti-Semitism that, you know, why would anybody want to go down there or live there? And so I felt like I was really wrong about that assessment. The people who have spent generations in the South just didn't, th th that was not the overriding narrative of their experience. The overriding narrative that I took away from many different people telling me these stories was the support of the Christian community. And in some cases, even the reverence of the Christian community towards the Jews for being, you know, into God and, and very learned and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, 
the Klan operated both north and south. I don't think that, um, I, I just didn't come away with, in reality, that the south was this um, more more racist or more anti-Semitic place than, than the north. So Kenneth asks, what drew, what first drew the Jewish people to these places in the first, in the deep south? Well, I mean, when Jews were coming over into this country as early as the late 1600s, um, some were going north, some were coming south. The er some of the earliest ports they were coming into was Savannah and Charleston. Savannah and Charleston. Um, Charleston was a place that had religious freedom. It was, it was very welcoming um, to people who were different. Um, I believe it was even written into the Carolina Constitution that Jews could uh, worship. Um, so, I mean, the history of migration, it, it, I, I don't think that people necessarily chose to wind up in, in the South per se or in any of these specific towns, but that there was just the freedom to do so. There was the freedom to come to this place where pretty much you had your religious freedom I mean, I'm in Virginia, and, and you know there were some some years where things had to get worked out. But compared to all the places that Jews had come from around the world, with inquisitions and and um, massacres and and all the things that had been done to them, by the time they got to America, this is where they could live free and set up businesses and be leaders and gain the respect of their Christian neighbors and vote and own land. I mean, so it was it was a welcoming place. There's inter good, interesting conversation going on in the chat. If you're not looking at the chats, other folks, um, I recommend that you do. Nancy has given us a list of some famous Jewish Masons, including Irving Berlin. Um, and Marcy um, is giving us some information about research on the Klan in the South and the different banners that spoke of hate for, of both Jews and Blacks, uh, particularly in the 1940s. Yeah, so I don't mean to minimize anti-Semitism. I'm just saying that the folks I spoke to did not, um, that, that wasn't part of the experience that they seemed to overwhelmingly um, have in their lives or, or shared with me. Elaine asks, what did you discover in, in your, um, in your, sorry, I just lost the question. What did you discover um, in your research about Shomer Tzaddik's? Hmm. Um, I have to tell you, I don't even know what that is, but maybe I'm just not like hearing you properly. Elaine, do you want to unmute and or add more in the chat. Yeah. Elaine? Okay. Lisa, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I wanted to know, Shomer, Shomer, Shomer um, Zadik, I think is, is, a, is a guardian of, uh, of the uh, wealth, the resources. Of a, of, a, of a community. And you wrote about it beautifully in um, the ISL, uh, ISIL, I think that's how you pronounce it. It's JL, uh, the, the magazine that we get. Uh, and it works well. Um, so, um, um, so, if you wanted to add to it or not. Yeah, I, I didn't write about it, but perhaps um, someone at the ISJL might be um, able to answer that question. Okay. Lisa. Lisa. Okay. Thanks, Risa. Anyway. Risa, you're muted. Hi, Gus. It's good to hear your voice. Hi, Lane. Um, I'm not sure which article you're speaking of. I'm looking at the most recent issue. I'm not sure if it was something you read in here about... about um, I, I thought you were saying uh, something else, show Mertzadik's. I am not sure which article you're referring to, but I'm going to call you tomorrow 
and ask you which article and we'll talk about it. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank I appreciate the question. So um, one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure we cover as we're going to need to wrap things up in a few minutes is what, how can people, what can readers do to help preserve what is left of these communities? You, you communities. You talked about some of the efforts in, in Natchez and in Port Gibson. Um, you and I have talked about some of the cemeteries. You know, what, what can people do um, to make sure that these communities aren't completely lost? Yeah, thank you for asking that. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to bring attention to some of these places. So I really appreciate that question. Um, well, first of all, I do want to just acknowledge and thank the Institute of Southern Jewish Life because um, they were super helpful in in my research, but they're also involved with some of this um, synagogue preservation. Um, there's also the Jewish Community Legacy Project. They are involved with helping congregations that are sort of on their way out um, figure out what to do with the building and what to do with the sacred objects. And so um, both of these places take donations and um, you know that's what some of that money goes to. Um, I also on my website, sueisenfeld.com, have a page for Sadaka and I've listed the ISJL and the Community Jewish Community Legacy Project, but also some of the specific communities that I went to, like Selma and like Natchez. And so if anyone wanted to donate to any of those places specifically, you can do it directly on my website. It goes directly to them. Um, I'm just posting it for information. And, you know, I'll just say too that I also am posting information there about the Andrew Goodman Foundation. Um, which does good work in terms of promoting um, democracy and voting rights, which is a, a theme in the book as well. Um, but those are some of the places I would recommend if you wanted to support uh, these places. Unfortunately, some of them that I went to are kind of like too far gone to even help, you know, with the one person that's left or sometimes no Jewish people are left. Um, but thankfully, there are several that still have a chance if they get the funding, such as Selma. I mean, they're doing a fundraising campaign. And um, well, you can see when you go on their site, you can see how far they've gotten towards their goal, which is a good amount, but not not that much. I saw that there was a question I might just address um, that somebody asked about Andrew Goodman. Um, Andrew Goodman was a distant cousin of mine. Um, and, you know, as you all might know, uh, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were three civil rights workers who were murdered in 1964 in Mississippi for doing voter registration work and related work in Mississippi. And um, they kind of got people's, they got white people's attention at that time because, because two of these three individuals were white and Jewish. Um, and, and so a lot of, a lot more people sort of got, became aware of what was happening in the South during the civil rights movement. And his brother, David Goodman, also my cousin, who I've been in touch with, um, a lot recently runs the Andrew Goodman Foundation as a nonpartisan organization promoting democracy and voting rights in Andrew Goodman's name. So I'm a big proponent. Thank you for asking. Margaret? Yes. Hi, I just wanted to mention, I'm, I'm David Barton and my wife is sitting here, Lynn Barton. We both are originally from Selma, Alabama. And uh, we've been an active part of trying to help uh, maintain that temple and the cemetery there into perpetuity. I see a little while ago, I believe Ronnie Lee was on this as well. He's done more than any of us have uh, in Selma to keep this uh, going. And uh, he's the day by day person. 
But I wanted to mention that we started back in 1997. It is not easy to preserve these temples when there's not a big congregation left in the, in the town. And we started in 1997, we had a reunion and had over 300 people who were descendants of the temple in Selma come from all over the country. Subsequently, we had another one, a reunion, and we had a, uh, we started an extended family also. And we continued to, to work on this. And now we're, we're having a meeting this weekend with the people who are working on keeping the temple going. But I just want to say it's a long, arduous process, but I wanted to mention that uh, and thank you for coming and thank you for your interest in the South. So, well, thanks for that comment. Yeah, I have a whole chapter about Ronnie Lee. He's a wonderful guy and um, was very helpful and educational in talking about Selma's Jewish community and history of civil rights in Selma. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, and thank you for coming and giving your talk. So, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for sharing that. And again, uh, those of you who, um, who haven't been looking at, at the chat, um, Alex is gonna leave it open for a little bit because people are sharing great information in there. Um, we are almost out of time. So I wanna wrap up a few things. Um, first of all, Sue, I wanna thank you for writing this book and telling the stories about these communities and then taking the time to be here with us remotely and have these conversations. Um, everyone out there, if you haven't bought the book, it's Wandering Dixie. It's available at local bookstores and at bookshop.org. Um, and because I have a captive audience, I'm gonna put in a plug for the new edition of my Moon Nashville to New Orleans road trip book. Uh, it will be out March 23rd. And it's a, it's a true travel guide, it includes advice on how to visit many of the towns that Sue talks about in her books. So where to stay, where to eat, uh, the museum in Jackson, Mississippi, where you can watch uh, really powerful videos about Andrew Goodman. Um, also, while I have a captive audience, I wanna remind you that we have two more conversations left in the Nashville, the Nashville Jewish book series this year. On April 13th, Bess Kalb will be with us discussing Nobody Will Tell You This But Me. And then on April 22nd, Michael Ian Black will be discussing A Better Man. So uh, thank you all for your interest in all this great conversation and questions. And um, thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you, Sue. And I'm just a reminder. And Thank you, ISJL. Thank you, Vanderbilt. Thank you all for being here. I am going to leave this open. It seems like there are a few people who, you know, are finding long lost connections on here and wanting to continue the conversation. So I will leave it open as well as the chat. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank Deanna. you all for coming. Deanna, are you still? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Who are you looking for, Dina? Yeah, oh, is it Dina? I can get you her, her information. Oh, yeah. she is here, Dina Gold. I was interested in hearing more about that Rosenwald program, but I will reach out to her. <laughs> yeah, I'm, hap I, I'm happy to put the information to get you the specifics. Um, can you put your email address and I can send it to you? Yeah, absolutely. It's an excellent documentary. I actually 